Okay, welcome. Uh, introduction to order theory, lecture 15. Uh, and today we will close the chapter on interval orders and uh, with a theorem. So here it is. For every interval order Q, uh, there exists a threshold, an integer d, such that whatever interval order P you take, uh, with the property that P has dimension at least D, then we will know for sure that uh, Q, we can find Q and P. Q is an induced subposit of P. This, uh, this property of interval orders is, is uh, very unique and we cannot hope for anything like that in, uh, in any reasonable class of forces. Uh, well, let's Simply because if you think of of a chain on three elements, yeah, then uh, you cannot force it in a pole set of large dimension, right? Because they are pole sets of height two with arbitrary large dimension. But uh, okay, maybe maybe you can think of height two pole sets, but then think of incidence pole sets and incident of, of graphs. Yeah, they also have arbitrary large dimension and. Uh, and there you don't have a maximum which is above three distinct elements because maximums correspond to edges, so they are above exactly two elements. So you cannot force that. Yeah? And uh, you can also think about these adjacency pole sets uh, of graphs with large GIF and large chromatic number given by Erdos construction. And there, uh, in the adjacency pole set of this, uh, the GIF is also large, so you don't have cycles and dimensions still unbounded, so uh, small cycles. So, uh, so nothing, you cannot really force a structure in such a direct way just, just with a large dimension. Yet, when we are with interval orders, we can actually force, we can actually see that the in, uh, interval orders of large dimension are somewhat universal. They contain everything what is small as an induced subposit. Um, okay, so in order to see it, we first uh, we first need to have uh, some understanding of overlap graphs. We already seen in last lecture that um, the important incomparable pairs, the ones that are difficult to reverse, are those that form steps. So the corresponding intervals overlap, and we will we'll need to work with that today as well. So uh, let's build some some uh, let's build some easy observations and definitions, so overlap graphs. Um, so first of all, uh, well two, two intervals overlap, but they overlap, yeah, so... than C less than B less than D or uh, C is less than A less than D less than B. So here it would be that A is the first step, AC, AC is the first step and uh, AB is the first step and CD is the second and here is the other we want. Yeah, so that's, that's an overlap. And now, <coughs> a graph is an overlap graph if it admits an interval representation such that whenever we have an edge in a graph, uh, the corresponding intervals overlap. Yeah? If it admits Such that uh, UV is an edge in the graph if and only if IU and IV 
overhook. Now, overhead graphs is a nice uh, class of graphs. They, for example, they are chi bounded, and recently we learned that they are actually polynomially chi bounded. Uh, there is nice uh, combinatorics uh, uh, involved here. We will need a specific lemma uh, that will, uh, uh, for uh, inside our proof uh, on this dimension stuff here. So uh, uh, here it is. Well, okay. Maybe first, before the lemma, uh, I should say that uh, when we have an overlap graph, we can fix an interval representation which is distinguishing. So all the endpoints are distinct. But we can always perturb it. And then when we think about a path in an overlap graph, yeah, uh, then this uh, is actually could look like this. So we start, you jump to a vertex, it's an overlap, you jump to some other vertex, an overlap, then you maybe jump here, and here, yeah, here, and maybe from here you, you overlap, you go here. All this is a, is a path, it's an induced path in, in, the, in this, uh, in the overlap graph, yeah. And then, uh, from the understanding how a path looks like, we see that it, the, the, the projection of the path, so the union of all intervals, must be an interval again. The same as in interval graphs, so graphs of, of intersections of intervals on, on a line, not overlaps but intersections. So, uh, so this says that uh, if only G is connected, yeah, G is an overlap graph and is connected, then the, then the union of all intervals from the representation is an, is an interval. Uh, okay, so now, uh, now we will state the lemma. So let G be uh, connected. Overlap graph. And let, uh, let I be its representation. Distinguishing. Then uh, let's uh, let, let also let's uh, let's fix the uh, in the interval representation. Let's fix a, let's fix an interval which is leftmost. Yeah, so le leftmost left end. Okay, let R be uh, a vertex in G uh, be a vertex. With uh, interval of leftmost left end, we'll call it sometimes the root, the root of this connected overlap graph. Now, uh, given an integer d positive, uh, consider a subgraph H. Uh, connected subgraph of G such that uh, all the vertices in H have the same distance to R in G such that uh, the distance in a graph from R to X is equal D for all uh, x vertices in H. Then, uh, for every x in H, we have the following. Let me continue from this point here.
So for every x in h, uh, there is y in, uh, in g such that point one uh, distance. Oh, okay. I denoted distance with d. Distance in g between uh, r and y is d minus one. Point two. I am i y and i x. So the intervals corresponding vertices overlap, which just means that the uh, uh, x, y is an edge in the graph here. Yeah? And three, uh, this interval of y actually overlaps. I will write it that it's not contained in the union, in the interval of the whole graph H, connected graph. So H is connected, so the union of its intervals form an interval, as I mentioned before. So if I take uh, all the vertices in H and take the uh, interval, then this forms an interval. And the interval of Y is not contained inside. Since, it's, uh, since it intersects, overlaps an inter uh, X, which is in H, this means that it intersects this interval. So, so this means that this overlaps I H. Okay. So uh, let's try to visualize what is going on here. So uh, we have a graph. So, uh, we have well, we have overlap graph G, yes. And um, and there is this root which is the leftmost. Then there is a subgraph H connected, yes. H. So uh, you can think of uh, some connected subgraphs. So it spans an interval on the line. So that, that's H, yes? And now we, uh, all, the, all the intervals here have the same distance to R in the overlap graph. Now, uh, you, can, you can fix your attention to some, to some red interval X, which is in, in H. So here is the interval of H now, yeah? And then, and then uh, well, we claim that there is a there is a vertex in G that overlaps X and has one shorter distance to R. This is quite obvious, yeah, because uh, all you need to look at is a is a path, shortest path from R to X, yes. And then uh, if we so let's already start the proof. Uh, so. Uh, let, let's fix this path, yes? So let's let, let Vd be x, and then we have, a, we have a path, and V0 is r, yes? So we have a sequence of vertices, Vd minus 1, put it out, V1, V0, yes? Uh, and now, uh, obviously, the Vd min minus 1 uh, um, vertex has distance d minus 1 to the root, yeah? And uh, it could look like this. It overlaps x. That's all we know for now. Uh, what we claim is actually, uh, what we want to prove is that it, uh, it satisfies item 3. So which means that it doesn't look like this. It means that this, this guy leaves h, intervals of h, interval of h, yes? So it overlaps it. Yeah? So for the purpose of the proof, let's assume, let's imagine for a moment that it's otherwise. So, yeah, so we can imagine the path. Yeah, jumping around, uh, say like this, I don't know, like this, and maybe now we are leaving, yeah? So Vd, Vd minus 1, but Vd minus 2, Vd minus 3, Vd minus 4, yes? Uh, this cannot be, this is a quick contradiction. Uh, it comes from the fact that uh, when we look at this interval that leaves IH, and there must be one, because on this path, from Vd to V0, V0 is not contained in H, yes? This comes from the fact that H are vertices of distance uh, uh, more than 0 to R, 
Yeah? So R is not contained in H, and we start with something contained in H, then so there is a transition point where we jump into something that is not contained in H, but it overlaps something that is contained in H, so it must overlap the, the red interval IH. Yeah? So this guy, first from X that leaves the interval of H, overlaps it. Now, since it overlaps it, and uh, you can look at its endpoint that is actually in the interval, you will find the red interval that is, uh, that is hit by this vertical line, yes? This comes from the fact that, uh, that, well, that that's the projection of H, so there is something here that projects, yeah? So there is this red interval that belongs to H, so it's of distance D, and it overlaps some blue interval. Now, this means that they, the, the distances of, of these two intervals to R are at most one off. So this means that this path cannot actually extend because that would be a, a, that would be a contradiction. So what we, what we argued here is that this blue interval that is leaving is actually the very next one from a x, yeah? So you could think of this. So this is our y, yes? Okay, and that's, uh, that's actually all the proof. Okay, so uh, that is a little tool we need uh, from the overlap graph, graph's perspective. And now, uh, now let's uh, go back to posted dimension. And let's uh, actually uh, specify this quantity uh, induced by just by incomparable pairs that form, that overlap, that form steps, because those are the difficult ones. Uh, so uh, the P, an interval order. I distinguishing representa interval representation of P. And now, uh, now yes, now we let's, let's, let's call S uh, incomparable pairs of P such that they form a step, yeah? So x is the first, y is the second, this is how it looks in i. Yeah? So that's a subset of incomparable pairs. And now let's, let's introduce notation, so let's call dim, dim star of, uh, this will be, um, this is built on interval representation, so I'm not putting here a post-it, but it's interval representation is the least integer t such that um, there is a family r of uh, t linear extensions such that uh, for every x, y in S, there is a linear extension in R that reverses it. Yeah? So y less than x in L. So uh, we don't reverse all the incomparable pairs, we just reverse steps. And uh, from what we see in the last lecture, the dim star is not far away from dim. And this is maybe the next thing we will see.
So uh, proposition. And it's, let's put it already in that context over there so I don't repeat the definitions. Dim star of i is less or equal than dim of p is less or equal than uh, 2 plus dim star of i. And, uh, well, this inequality is immediate as um, here, when we take a realizer witnessing that, we reverse all the incomparable pairs. So in particular, we reverse steps. So that's, that's, that's the inequality. This one, we kind of already seen. So uh, for this one, for the proof of this one, we should consider two uh, linear extensions of uh, P. One is the L left, where we go. We have distinguishing uh, interval representations, so no, no endpoints coincide. So that's just increasing left ends and L right, increasing right ends. It is obvious that. Um, this is a linear extension, these two are linear extensions of P. And uh, when we have those two and we ask a question, we pose a question, what remains remain to be reversed? What pairs? The answer for that is uh, actually the steps. Yeah? So, uh, by definition, we can reverse all the steps using dim star i mm, linear extensions. So in total, taking these two and these, we will have a realizer uh, of p, which completes the proof. Okay, so uh, this is good. And now, uh, now we take uh, another proposition. Uh, so we take an interval order and uh, distinguishing interval representation. is uh, induced by, uh, is witnessed by a connected component in the corresponding overlap graph. So let uh, I1, Is be, uh, be subsets partition of, uh, of I inducing connected com uh, components of uh, GI. Now GI is the uh, overlap graph of I. Then, uh, then what we want to uh, see is that the dimension of dimension star of I is witnessed by one of its components. So. Yeah, J in in S. Okay. And second point is uh, is about uh, splitting I into two into two blocks. Yeah. So uh, let X one X two be a partition of 
time into two blocks. Uh, then what we have is that dimension, star dimension of i is at most 2 plus uh, maximum of star dimensions of uh, xj. J is in 2. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that's a, well, that's a proposition. Uh, what uh, what do we need to see to 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 argue that it actually holds? So um, for the for the first part, um, what you should see is that uh, when you when you look at the dim star of each connected component of I, yeah, then uh, then you think of uh, then you can think of linear extensions. So for each ij, you can have a realizer. And you can have these linear extensions that witness them star ij. And now, uh, I think you should notice is that uh, you can read linear extension as a marking function. So any linear extension uh, in the distinguishing uh, representation has a corresponding marking function. This is one thing to notice. And then, uh, and then uh, what you should do is, you, when you take uh, two marking functions for two distinct components of i, you can actually merge them, yeah? And you can have a linear extension that witnesses, uh, do, does the job for both in the same time, yes? And with these two observations, you will, you will prove this, uh, that uh, this, this holds. Now, for this, uh, for this item here, this we basically already did, so, uh, so for the for the usual dimension and the proof for star dimension is the same. So uh, you take these two blocks, and uh, what you do is you devise two special linear extensions. But again, based on marking functions. So one linear extension would be you would put uh, marks on left ends of x1 and right ends of x2, and the other would be right ends of x, x1 and left ends of x2. Yeah, and with, with, with these two corresponding linear extensions, you will you will revert actually all incomparable pairs uh, of, uh, from x1 cross x2 and x2 cross x1. Yeah, not only steps, all of them. Yeah, and then, so then you only have to uh, worry about steps in, the, in each of the blocks, so the inequality holds. Okay, um, well, with this in mind, we can actually move on and uh, and introduce the main uh, technical uh, technical um, ingredient in the proof of the theorem. So uh, so we want to show that a pole set with large dimension contains a small pole set or every small ball set. So we will actually show that it contains a universal interval order. Uh, but it's actually, it will be easier to, to go, to have an intermediate step and for something which, which looks like a universal interval order. And this, uh, this will be called a thicket. So the definition is that the uh, end thicket is a pole set with a ground set um, x1 up to xn and uh, yjk for all j less than k within 1 to n, such that, uh, such that the following three things hold. First, uh, x is form a chain.
second uh, xi is less than yjk if and only if i is less than j is less than k and three yjk is less than xi in p if and only if j is less than k less than i. Okay, so that's a definition. Let's let's try to visualize the structure a bit. So uh, so we have a chain, yes? X1, x2, x3, x4, x5. And now we have these y's that somewhat correspond to intervals uh, with integer points between 1 and n. So, for example, that could be seen as y to r, uh, 4. y to 4. So, what do we know about y to 4? We know that it's smaller than x5, uh, five, that it's larger than x1, and it's incomparable with all, everything in between. Yes? Yeah. So we also have uh, y12, yeah? And we know that it is smaller than x3, yeah? Nothing direct is stated by the, about comparabilities, the comparability status between y's. We can derive something, yeah? Because if we have y45 here, then, uh, then it is actually above x3, so this must be below this, yeah? But, uh, uh, but there are options and uh, a thicket, uh, n thicket is not actually a, a single pulset but it's, uh, but there are options for, uh, for the comparability status for the y's which are really almost overlapping. Uh, now, but what is the, what is important for us is that a large thicket in an interval order forces a large universal interval order as a sub -pulset. So uh, let P be an interval order and uh, if, uh, if T is a induced subposet of P for some uh, free N ticket Then, then P contains a universal interval order on order N, yes? So, uh, so we want to argue this. And uh, so what we will think of is a, is a function that sends the elements of the universal interval order to elements of our pulse set. These will be actually elements of the thicket. So we first have to fix the, the free end thicket in the pulse set, and then we will send interval ij to uh, element y, 3i minus 1, 3j. And now we claim that uh, with such a mapping, the, the elements in P actually form a, a, a universal interval order of order n. So in order to see it, we need to, we need to check two things. First, we need to take two, two uh, elements that are comparable in un. So ij less than kl in un, which boils down to the thing that j is less than k simply. And now, uh, now if we see what it is, is it sent? To. So this guy is sent to y 3i minus 1 3j and this guy is sent to y 3k minus 1 3l, yeah? But since, uh, okay, um, how do I proceed? Well, I want to leave the statement of the theorem, so maybe I will... Yeah, maybe I'll move here. <laughs>
So, uh, okay. So we have these two elements. And uh, since j is less than k, we know that uh, mm, 3k minus 1 is uh, greater than 3. Oh, okay. We know that 3j. <coughs> No, what am I doing? 3k minus 1 is uh, greater or equal than 3j plus 1 minus 1, which is 3j minus 2. Okay, so now when we look at, the, at, the, at our chains, chain of x's around x, 3j, yeah? So, uh, we have this interval ij sent to 3i minus 1, 3j. So this is basically how it looks like. And uh, we have this comparability here. Okay, and uh, this interval kl is sent to y 3k minus 1, 3l, but 3k minus 1 is at least 3j plus 2. Yeah, so uh, so it ends like somewhat here, right? So uh, or higher, but for sure it is above x j three j plus one. Yes. Uh, actually, I yeah, I did something silly here. So this is that's why it was confusing. So this guy is below x3j, and this guy is above x3j plus 1. So, uh, so they will be comparable, yeah? So y 3i minus 1 3j is less than xj, which is less than y 3k minus 1 3l. This is happening in t, so as well in p. Uh, so indeed, we have that uh, that uh, when we map two comparable elements, we have the uh, we have the comparability. And now, when we think of incomparable elements, so when we take i j incomparable with kl, so now we have to look how the incomparability looks like. The intervals intersect. So uh, so you have i j. And then you, you might have KL. This might be an overlap, yeah? And then I want to fix the, uh, the, the endpoints like this. The, there, there might be a containment. And then I want um, J to be here. So that would be IJ and that would be KL. Yes? So I want to look at the, at the end, uh, left endpoint K and the right endpoint J. And I always want to see uh, this, so k is less or equal l, yes? Uh, j, excuse me. And now, uh, what does it relate to? So if you, if you again look at the, at the, at the thicket around x3j, yeah? So on one hand, we have an interval ij that ends somewhere around here. So this corresponds to, uh, y 3i minus 1 3 j, 3, uh, 3 j, so this is something of this form, yeah? So it is comparable with the next guy here, but what we know for sure, that it's incomparable with the two guys here, this is what I want to record. And then when we look at the uh, uh, map of this kl guy, mm, k is less or equal l, so uh, so it is, it is, it looks like this or is lower, yeah? So this is the 3k minus 1, 3l. So there is a comparability possibly here, but for sure again, we have the incomparability here and here. So after all, we have, uh, we have two elements, x, 3j, and x, 3j minus 1. That should be minus 1 and minus 2. Don't you think? Yes. 
the J3I minus 1 is below the X3J. The, the Y 3J 3I minus 1. Uh, 3J minus 1. Uh, sorry. Ah, this is the upper. <coughs> then, then, you, then you got it wrong on the other picture. Here? Oh, uh, you mean here? Here? Yeah. yeah. IJ? Oh. Yes, yes, yes. Somewhat was. Okay, thank you. So I thought. Yes, yes, yes. So that was here. And then the comparability goes through this one here. So. Uh, it's tight. It's, this is tight, yes. That makes sense. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. That's correct. But uh, going back here, we have two elements comparable. Both of them are incomparable with these two. And, uh, and now we, we know that the P is 2 plus 2, 3 because it's an integral order. This means that we cannot see a comparability here. So, uh, so the, the maps are incomparable when we put two incomparable elements of UN. This closes the proof that, uh, that we can find, given a free and fit ticket, we can find a universal interval order of order n in our faucet. Okay, so, um, so this is good. And now we are ready for the main technical statement and to prove the theorem. So uh, maybe let me leave this proposition here, just remove the proof. And here is the theorem. So, uh, so what we want to prove is as follows. Uh, or maybe actually, let's do it here. So let P, let uh, let m be an integer greater or equal to and p be an interval order. With uh, distinguishing interval representation i. Now, if star dimension of i is, uh, is large, and now we want to put here 6m minus 10, then um, we have a, not a universal interval order, but then p contains and M thicket. Okay. Yes, so uh, given a star dimension large, we can force an M ticket. And we have seen that when we have an M ticket, we can have an universal interval order, which should close the theorem. So a corollary, corollary will be as follows that uh, let P be an interval order mm. let Q be an interval order as well on well, then elements, this one And P is an interval order 
And now, if dimension of P is at least, and I want to have 36n minus 8, then Q is contained in P. And uh, we can actually prove it in this corollary. So what do we do? So uh, let's let's start with this bound 36. So the factors are 6, 3, and 2, n minus 8. This is this is a lower bound on dimension. Now we know that the the dim star. So we fix a distinguishing interval representation of p, and then this dim star is at most then P is bounded by dim star plus 2, yeah? which makes it that dim star is at least 6 times 3 times 2 n minus 10. Now applying our main theorem, we know that we can find a, a ticket. What is the size of a ticket? A ticket of size 3 times 2 times n, yes? Yeah? So this implies that uh, P contains uh, 3 times 2n ticket P. Now, we know that the, we know that the mm, uh, 3 times 2n ticket forces uh, P to have a universal interval order. So we know that universal interval order of order 2n is induced supposed of P. But, uh, but in this universal interval order you can find Q on n elements. Because, uh, well, we already did it last lecture. So that, that would complete the proof. And all we need to do is to find an argument for the technical statement which is which is here at, the, at this part. So uh, let's jump into the proof. Okay. So uh, so this will be this will be an induction on M. And first we want to solve the case m equals 2. So when m equals 2, what we know from the assumption is that uh, dim star i is at least uh, 6 times 2 minus 10, which is 2. OK, now we want to force a, a 2 ticket, yes, in this setup. So a 2 ticket. is, uh, looks like this, this is x1, this is x2, and, uh, and then, uh, uh, okay, so uh, we want to force a two ticket, the two ticket looks like x1, x2, and uh, y uh, y one two so this is two plus one poset yeah and uh, so let's imagine that p p doesn't contain this one so p uh, does not contain two plus one so we know that these po that such a poset is a weak order yeah a weak order is a pulse set that is a union of antichains, yeah, with complete uh, comparability status between them, yeah. So, uh, but if we have such a such a thing and we look at its um, uh, interval representation, then the corresponding antichains, yeah. So, okay, they could have some steps, yeah. 
maybe the, there's the, the, uh, the integrals are contained in each other, yeah? But uh, the, there's a clear cut between one group and the second group, yes? So the claim here is that we can, that the dim star of the, such an object, yeah, is at most one, yeah? And uh, this is simply because you can just take, just take a, a marking function to be like this, yes? And uh, actually, if, if we have intervals contained in each other, then there are no steps. So the dim star could be actually only zero. Anyway, uh, this is a contradiction because uh, we started with a post set with dim star at least two. So, uh, so we are forcing two plus, it's a contradiction that there is no two plus one, so we have a two ticket. And now we make an induction step. Okay, so for the induction step, uh, we, have the, we have our intervals, distinguishing represent, interval representation of P. And uh, first of all, we, we, got, uh, we take connected components in, uh, in the corresponding overlap graph. So this interval representation induces some overlap graph. And the subsets of intervals uh, induce connected components in that overlap graph. And from what we discussed earlier, we know that uh, the star dimension of I is witnessed by by some star dimension of some uh, some of its component, yeah. So from now on, we can simply assume that i is actually equal i j. So in other words, we can assume that it's connected. The over, uh, induced overlap graph is connected. Okay. So this is one thing. Now, uh, now we will uh, when we have this interval representation, we again have this interval with the leftmost left end, and we call it R, or sometimes I will refer to it as the root. Yes? And uh, so, leftmost, yeah. And now, uh, now what would we do? We just uh, split uh, intervals with respect to distance to the root, yeah? So we can, we can say, you can say that we do BFS layering. Yeah, so for k greater or equal zero integer, we consider a set of intervals dk, which is, which is uh, intervals in i, such that the distance in g from r to x is exactly k. Yes? And now, uh, so we want to group those layers into two, yeah? Taking every second layer into one group. So all layers with odd indices in one and all layers with even indices in the other. So we can call these sets W0 and W1. Yes? So W0 is the union of dk where k is uh, even and W1 is the union of dk when k is odd. Now, uh, now we need one more thing. So if, if we have an interval x, which is, which is in i, and it is not the root, yeah? So you can think of its, uh, of its path to the root, yeah? And uh, so this is the root, yeah? And this, in general, will be somewhere to the right, yeah? And uh, on this path to the root, there is an interval which is just before it, yeah? And this interval must overlap x, yeah? And then uh, if the, the interval if the interval overlaps this way, we say that x is suppo uh, supported from the left. Yeah? Supported from left. And uh, if, if we have the situation where that the, the interval on the shortest path to the root is overlaps this way, then we say that x is supported from the right. Well, an interval could be supported from both uh, both directions, uh, and now we want to split. Uh, we want to split uh, the w's into into two. So for actually for uh, each alpha in zero one, we want to split w alpha into two. Yeah, into w alpha left 
NW alpha right. And W alpha left are all the axes in W alpha such that X is left supported. Supported from left, sorry. Yeah? And, and here the same, but supported from right. Yeah? Um, okay, so actually those, those intervals that are supported from both sides could end up in, in any of these two. For convenience, we can think of it as a partition, so we put them in exactly one of the two. And then there is an extra problem with, with x being a root, so you can, you can put it anywhere you want. So root is in the w0, because it's in an even distance, and then, and then you put it in w0l or w0r, doesn't matter really. Uh, what we want to do now is we want to apply the lemma, the proposition where we where we were, um, uh, where we said that uh, when something has large dim star, then one of its block in any partition must have large dim star. Yes, and then we were losing the, going into the block. We are losing at most two from the dim star, and now we want to first go into W zero W one, and then from that one with larger dim star, we want to go to W alpha, uh, alpha L or, or alpha R. Yeah, so applying twice uh, proposition, we get that uh, there exists alpha in 0, 1, and there exists beta in LR, such that bin uh, star W alpha beta is at least, and now we need an original bound, which is 6n minus 10. And now we have to subtract 2 for one application and 2 for the other application. So minus 4. Okay, this is good. alpha beta, yeah, and we have W alpha beta. And uh, now we want to choose a component uh, J of, uh, of, the, of the overlap graph induced by alpha beta. And uh, again, from the thing we already used here, we know that uh, we want to choose a component that witnesses dim star. Yes. So such that um, such that dim star of J is actually equal dim star of W alpha beta. Yeah. Okay. So we have J. That is uh, that is connected, yeah. Now, uh, now I want you to recall that when we were doing this alpha business, we were splitting. Uh, so here there are there are intervals all in all the distance to R or all in even distance to R. So uh, now when we took a connected component of this, it actually boils down to the fact that there exists uh, there exists integer k greater or equal to zero such that um, uh, for every x in j distance in g from the root to x is exactly k all of them are in the same distance this is simply because you can imagine that in the overlap graph 
these guys were in distance two, and there are some guys perhaps in distance yeah four, yeah. But uh, they cannot overlap, yeah, between each other. So when we take a connected component that witnesses dim star, we all have we only have uh, intervals in the same distance to to our root. Okay, so uh, so this is good. And now finally, we we shape off one more thing. Uh, so we apply proposition again. To what? To, so we take uh, we take uh, a partition of J into Y uh, maximal intervals of J in P. In P, do we have P here? Uh, we have P, so we can take it uh, and uh, and Z, which is the rest. Yeah. So for a moment, please recall that uh, that when we have these uh, this family J, let's let's call it let's call it uh, let's call it yellow. Yes. So uh, we have lots of properties, but we after all these are intervals, and we we have an interval order on, on them. Yes. So there are intervals that are in, that are maximal in this family. Yes. So here the, these would be the ones. Yeah. So I want them to be my Y. Yeah, and I want the rest to be my z, and then uh, and then uh, when we apply the when we apply the proposition again, we know that the dim star of J is uh, is uh, at least two plus maximum of dim star. Of, uh, of y and dim star of z. Now, actually, we know which uh, which one which one witnesses the dimension here because uh, the family y this time is very very simple. Yeah, uh, th this consists of intervals that pairwise intersect each other. So, uh, well. Um, as we have seen with the weak orders, yeah, the dim star of this is actually at most one because we can take a marking function that, that does this, yes? So dim star, we know that the dim star of y is at most one. So the whole dimension, which is still large, uh, is witnessed by dim star z. Yes? So after all, we end up with the thing that dim star of z is at least, and now, where did we have the bound for J? Uh, it is W alpha B, but uh, this is this. So 6N minus 14 minus 2, so 6N minus 16, which is actually 6N minus 1 minus 10. So we are ready to, to call inductive hypothesis. Okay, so... Um, for the inductive hypothesis, we can find we can find an n minus one ticket in uh, in Z. Z contains an uh, m minus one ticket T. Okay. So uh, okay, let's try to visualize it again. Yes. So here is Z, and here is Y. In Z, we can find this ticket, yeah? So we can find some intervals that contribute to our structure. Now, what we want to do is what we want to extend the ticket, 
yeah, to get an end ticket. Uh, okay, now I, I actually have recalled that um, So at the moment when we when we fix J, when we took J, yes, and we notice that all of them are on the same distance, what I actually want to uh, want to suppose is an evaluation of beta. So beta could be left or right, and depending on which one is it, I would strip off the maximal elements or the minimal elements. So since I did the maximal elements, I had in mind that beta is equal R, and the whole proof is symmetric if beta is equal L. So, uh, so beta is equal R. So intervals are supported from the right. And now uh, let's. So what is the M, M ticket? Yeah, M ticket cons consists of a chain of length x minus m uh, of length m minus one and some and some objects of y that look like an interval a bit. Yeah. Now. Now what we want to, and this is this this should be yellow, I guess. But uh, what we want to contribute is uh, is an element x n, which is at the top of the chain, and we want to contribute elements of the type y i n, where i goes from one to n minus one. So this should look like an interval that you know. So there is a there is a x i over here, yeah. And then, yes, so we want to have y i m, and what we want to have from it is that this guy is, uh, from the definition of the ticket, should be above all the x's that are below, and should be incomparable with all the x's here. This is all we need to do. We need to find x m, and for each i, we need to find a y i m that is incomparable with the respective x's and above other respective x's. Okay, so here's what we do. So first, for the, for the xm guy, what we do is we look at the y's and we take from them an interval with the rightmost left end. So, uh, so this would be the interval and we will call it xn, yes? So note Note that this interval is above all yellow intervals, so all intervals in Z. Because if it would be not above some of one of them, then this one would be actually red, maximal as well. But it's not. So it is below some maximal element, and since we have intervals, it must be below Xm. Okay, so we have Xm, which is actually above all our structure here, which is fine. What is important is that it's above all our chain. Now, when we, when we want to devise y i n, we look at x i. So x i could be our guy here. This is an interval x i. And now, what we need to do is uh, we need to recall that uh, this uh, actually set here um, is something that lives in um, that it lives in uh, W alpha. This is less important. Beta, and I assume that beta is R. So it's right supported. Maybe there is a tiny technical detail here that actually it is supported. It's not the root. Yeah. So everything is. So I, I wrote here k greater or equal zero. That it's obvious that the k is greater or equal one because if it's zero then it's just one interval in the, in the business and the one interval cannot have large uh, star dimension. So uh, we talk about intervals that are in a healthy distance from the root and they are all supported from the right. So now uh, let's take a support of xi. Yeah? So this is an interval which is closer to the root, yes? In the overlap graph, it's closer to the root. So yet it is, first of all, different than all of the stuff here because this is in distance k, and I'm taking an interval in distance k minus 1. It overlaps xi, and now, from the lemma about overlap graphs that uh, we kind of started this story today, we know that this interval must leave the projection of, of 
W alpha R. Well, actually, we need to make it connected, so the projection of J. Once it is connected, and J is connected, we know that if we want to support someone, we need to leave the projection. That was the, that was the statement. So we know that the blue guy actually leaves the whole business here. And we claim that this is, this is the right interval to represent Y I M. Well, what we need to say again, it is incomparable with these axes and it's above these axes. So where are the axes? So that was X I, yes? And X I is about X I minus one, which is about X I minus two and so on. Yeah, the blue interval overlaps X I, overlaps it. It doesn't contain it, it ends here which means that indeed it's right of all the previous axes and it actually contains all the, all the higher axes which, uh, which makes it incomparable in the, in the pose set as uh, we, it's required in the ticket. So this way each x gets its support and, uh, and these blue intervals together with xm extend the nm minus 1 ticket to the m ticket. This causes the proof for the, for the technical statement of the theorem. So indeed, large dimensional interval orders are somewhat universal. Uh, with this happy note, we close the chapter on interval orders and we move on. <coughs> yes, we move into the chapter on extremal problems and uh, we have left maybe 20 minutes so um, maybe we are not going to see a proof today but at least I, I have a good piece of time for an introduction to the, to the first section in this chapter. Okay, so uh, let me write where we are. So this chapter will be a will be a collection of four uh, independent things, and the first the first section here is about applications of Dilbert's theorem. to geometric problems. So, so this is our, our uh, topic. Um, but we, we start with some consideration that are off from both of these. Let's, let's look at, at graphs. And uh, when we look at graphs, one of the things we like to do is we look at colorings. And when we look at colorings, we relate it to cliques. Uh, and maybe to holes. So, colorings and cliques. The, the, the first the first uh, relation that comes into mind is that the that the uh, click number omega is always a lower bound to the coloring number chi, and uh, it may happen that these two numbers are equal, and. Uh, may happen that these numbers are not only equal for the graph but even for 
for all the induced subgraphs, and in this case, we call a graph perfect. And uh, yeah, we know some classes of perfect graphs, for example, comparability graphs, incomparability graphs, and there are some, a few more, but these are the most important to us at least. Um, and yeah, so perfect graph have been a, have been a big topic in the uh, in the eighties, nineties, uh, early early years of the century until uh, the the strong perfect graph theorem was proven, which gives a precise characterization. Of, of perfect graphs. Graph is perfect if it has no odd uh, hole and no odd anti-hole. So no. Um, yeah, and and since then the the uh, interest has moved to a class which has a weaker property than this one. Uh, so in in some classes of graphs, we can bound the chromatic number by some function of the click number. And, and this is a property that we call chi-boundedness. And um, yeah, so again we are interested in, in classes of graphs where every member of the class has is a universal function so that every member of the class is, is in this uh, thing. Yeah, but uh, not all, not all classes of graphs, not all graphs are chi bounded, and uh, and uh, an easy uh, criterion for not being chi bounded is uh, if you find in your class, if you find there a graph which is triangle free and has high chromatic number, so for and so you find a family of graphs which are triangle free and their chromatic number goes to infinity. So this would be a triangle, triangle free and chi unbounded. And uh, yeah, we, we have seen, for example, that shift graphs are in this class. And, um, but it can, it can be even, even worse. We know that there is, exist graphs with large curves and uh, high unbounded. So you can, you can forbid triangles and, and four cycles and whatever, and still still you, you get this. So this is, um, it's not really a hierarchy of classes of, of where, where you can sort in classes of graphs, um, because there is a different, uh, yeah, there's a twist. These are, these two properties should hold for every graph in the class, and here you have some existential quantor saying that in the graph you find something which goes this way. Yeah, so, but these things are, are intensely studied for hereditary classes of graphs, meaning that if you have a member in the class, and you look at an induced subgraph, and this induced subgraph is again in the class. And uh, and, and here it comes that uh, it makes sense to go to geometry because a geometry is providing us with with lots of classes of hereditary uh, with this hereditary nature nature. For example, uh, interval graphs. If you if you have an interval representation and you throw away some intervals, uh, still remaining an interval representation. Yeah, um, and let's let's look at some examples. So 
segment intersection. We have some segments in general segment intersection graph would come from a family of segments and you every segment is a vertex and you get an edge when you have an intersection. But uh, on segment intersection graphs you have you have some some freedom of uh, restricting the representation. So uh, one one way of restricting it is if we if we fix two lines and we only look at segments which are between these two lines. Now, uh, this is known as a permutation graph. Uh, this is a comparability graph of a two-dimensional order, so it's perfect. So, segments, intersection graphs of segments between two lines are perfect. Now, if you if you remove one of the lines and you you allow and you allow only stuff which is which is fixed on one line, then then things become a bit wider and you are in this class, but you are still chi bounded. There is a function so that the chromatic number of these graphs, if you forbid a, pairwise, uh, a group of segments which are pairwise intersecting of a given size, this is a click size, then you can bound the chromatic number. So this is grounded segments. Now, if you, if you, uh, if you go to the general class, and it has been shown a few years ago by by uh, a group from Krakow here, that uh, then you are here. This is segments in R two, and uh, and then if you if you go in higher higher space are d, d at least 3, then you can find objects uh, which have large squares and unbounded chromatic number. So, so here you see all these, all these objects, all these classes, all these properties can be, can be found in the in segment intersection graph. And now, uh, Let's, let's look at, a, at another example. Um, let's look at uh, box intersections. So what's, what is a box? A box is an axis aligned uh, box in, in space. In, so you can also take it as uh, you take the space with its uh, natural coordinate axis and you take an interval on each of the axis and you take a product of these. This is a box. And um, so boxes in one dimension are intervals. Uh, so the intersection graph of boxes in one dimension is an interval graph, it's perfect. Uh, If you if you go in two dimensions, then it's a classical result from the 60s that uh, they can be put here. Uh, rectangle intersection graphs are in this class, and uh, and it was long known for a long time that uh, three-dimensional uh, box intersection graphs fall in this class. And in this class, 
you have uh, you have examples where the chromatic number gets unbounded and you have, don't have triangles. This is a Berlin construction, and uh, now we know that actually it goes here. And um, yeah, let's look at yet another another geometric construction. Um, segment disjointness. So this is just the segment disjointness graph is just a complement of the segment intersection graph. And um, well, again, we we can restrict the family of segments. And the first thing that we can do is we can look at between two lines. And if you look at the, the jointness graph of segments between uh, two lines, this is the same as the intersection graph of segments between two lines. So uh, if you model one of them as an intersection, as a, as a comparability graph of a two-dimensional post set, then the other one is an incomparability graph. So uh, between two lines, we are here, and uh, in any RD, D at least two, we are here. So in this this family of in, of, of graphs is is better behaving than the segment intersection graphs where you have examples on this side. So. Uh, so what we are going to to do in the in this in this uh, part, we're going to see a proof for this one, and we are going to see a proof of this one for the case uh, d equals two. And uh, yeah, something I I may have said or I may not have said. Uh, these two things here, they are really fresh. They are from this year. Actually, I learned about them only uh, maybe two weeks ago. Yeah, uh, I think we are all, almost done with the time, and it's not bad if we stop one minute earlier in this lecture. So uh, we look forward to see these proofs. See you then.